I want to welcome you to the next episode of the Plugged In podcast. And today we have Dr. Marcus Weller. Marcus is the CEO and founder of Deep Invent and is also a neuroscientist. It's great to have you on the show today, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. Good. So, I mean, the interesting thing with this podcast, obviously, is we focus a lot on AI technology, fintech, and, and sometimes we have to cut through some of the the technology uh, and some of those uh, interesting ideals uh, for, for, from your point of view, probably a second nature, and maybe for others that are outside of this industry, sometimes I think it's it's helpful. I noticed that one of the things on your LinkedIn is that you're building frontier AI for patents, but what does that really mean in, in layman terms? Yeah, so my background is in cognitive science and um, what we really focus on at Deep Invent is uh, using cognitive heuristics of humans. So these thinking strategies that humans use, uh, and in particular, which humans? It's the humans that can innovate, that are that are prodigious innovators. And um, we map those cognitive heuristics into uh, a constellation of AI models. These AI models interact with each other, and then they generate new inventions for the sake of humanity. Um, and so the way that we've constructed this is not to replace human ingenuity, but to augment it and to put you know, these AI systems in alignment with the needs of humanity and the progression of the species. So that's really what we're trying to do at the societal level is bring these tools to, to any average person um, and any R&D person, any person that works in a, in a company or has a startup or has an idea, they can put that idea into the system. Then what it will do is it will sort of reconceptualize that idea and it will do that with the latest science, the latest patents that are available in the world and the latest industry research about where that's heading, it will sort of reconceptualize that idea, turn it into a new invention that then can be built. And in addition to that, that sort of reinvention of the idea, um, it will also draft a patent that that person can then either protect, they can file that with the USPTO, or they can also keep that as a trade secret and build that. Um, but but either way, what it's doing is it's sort of crystallizing sort of a loose idea or a fuzzy idea or a hypothesis into something that can actually be built for the good of humanity. Do you believe that anybody can innovate? I believe that with the right tools, anyone can innovate because I think that we're born with the ability to to innovate to think of new ways of doing things and to recombine ideas from, from disparate fields before we learn that there are separate sort of arbitrary categories of knowledge. Before that point, we're able to loosely associate across domains that, that we're, we're born with that. That's an inveterate capability. That's what got us here to this day. Those are the shoulders of the giants upon which we stand is that all these generations of humans leading up to us, they've been they've been innovating. They're, they're the ones that got us here so that we can have this conversation today on this computer. Um, and I think that's the capability that we want to, you know, augment. And, you know, for those adults that are using the system, you know, this sort of gives them that polymathic capability where they can reason across fields of study instantaneously and understand the rationale. And also even for, um, you know, for other users, we have users that range in age from seven years old all the way up to uh, people in their 80s. So um, it's really, I think it's a it's a wonderful, just innately human experience to innovate, right? And and that's why I think users uh, fall in love with this process so much. Do you feel like Deep Invent serves people better that have more of a natural curiosity and ability to innovate? Because obviously you're, you're saying that anybody can innovate. But do you feel like Deep Invent really adds another level to those that are already kind of really full of ideas rather than struggling and maybe falling onto something? Do you, do you feel like if you feed it better, will it produce better? Deep Invent is kind of like a microcosm of life. The quality of the answers that you get are tightly correlated to the quality of the questions that you ask. Mm -hmm. So you do want to, um, the, the better you are at formulating hypotheses or questions or being observant about your environment and asking incisive, 
you know, questions about the world, the better that you're able to leverage this tool, right? This is a tool that um, basically multiplies your ability to derive information um, and insights from the world by a thousand X. And so the, 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 imagine, I mean, the quality of the questions you ask, if you're asking it to invent, you know, a better mousetrap, Versus if you're asking it, you know, how to um, modulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so that we, you know, prevent global catastrophe, you're going to get, you know, a different quality uh, and importance of the answer that it provides. And what do you feel like it means for the future of human creativity and entrepreneurship, enabling anyone the ability to be able to generate patents and ready ideas at scale? Man, I when 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 AI was kind of emerging in 2015, I had some reservations about it. You know, I started learning about neural networks my very first time in 2003, so you know, over 20 years ago now, and um, that was from a biological perspective, from the wet nets between our ears, our brains. Um, those are those are um, neural networks, right? And as I saw these artificial systems become more and more mature and their, their compute capability growing, I had some concerns about alignment. Will these systems be in alignment with, with, with humanity? Now, uh, I think that there's a why there's two broad schools of camps that one is in alignment with, you know, human ingenuity and our incentives and our, our needs as a, as a species. And then there's another camp that says it's fundamentally out of alignment or it's on a path to misalignment with humanity and that this means that um, we'll have this very misanthropic you know uh type of intelligence that is uh, against human interests um or apathetic to human interests my feeling is that you know or what you know our belief is at deep invent is that we can affect that future if a if a dystopian future is possible that means it's not certain that means it's only possible. And that also means that a bright and better future for humanity is also possible. And so what that indicates to us is the onus is upon us to craft that future that we want to have. And so that's really the, the mission and the purpose and, uh, and the, the reason for existing for Deep Invent is that we can distribute these tools that augment human ingenuity, the, 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 which is the distillation of, of, of what the universe, the best the universe can provide. So far, we know that innovative behavior from humans is the distillation of human cognitive ability, which is a distillation of the mind, which is the most complex and interesting thing that the universe has ever created, right? And so we need to, we need to you know, lean into that and augment that as much as possible because what we've seen over generations is that human life has gotten better and better. The world is still terrible in some ways, but it's certainly better than it's ever been for the average person net on net, right? And, and that comes from human ingenuity. That doesn't happen automatically. We have to have the agency to, to try to make that and create that better future. That happened through people inventing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the, that's the fundamental capability that we want to um, continue to push forward and to augment. And I believe that these artificial systems uniquely have the capability because of the way that they can think like humans. Uh, and if they're trained to think like humans, that they uniquely have the capability to bring us there. Mm. And is there a specific industry uh, that you're seeing being transformed by Deep Invent? The areas that we're seeing right now, broadly speaking, are the, the areas of technology. Um, and I think that's because there is so much undiscovered public knowledge in all of these technical domains. I think people sometimes get the impression that, you know, half of the inventions that we'll ever invent, invent have already been invented. You know, that, that some large measurable fraction of our total ingenuity has been captured by now. I completely disagree with that sentiment. In fact, I think that it's less than a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent and it might be unbounded the amount of innovation that is possible by recombining new things generating new knowledge gen through the scientific method and generating new inventions through an invention method like deep invent it might mean that we can invent infinitely mm -hmm. that there is no you know maximum level right and so i think that's what is so fascinating about this technology and what really drew me into this as a as a cognitive scientist is can we make a system 
that can do or augment the, the, the best of what we can do with human thinking? And will that somehow unlock, you know, an infinitely positive future for us? Mm. And I, I think like, you know, I don't know what the, I don't think anyone knows what the probability of that, that statement truly is, but it's not zero. Mm. And, you know, when you think about like super intelligent systems, artificial super intelligence, right? What you would expect to see on the way to super intelligence, whatever that is, um, because we have, we have some competing definitions around that, you would expect to see a system that can actually invent new things mm. to better humanity, right? And there's a lot of these labs out there that are saying we're building super intelligence, you know, and I think that's great. And there, there needs to be multiple competing labs in order to, in order to do that and to balance out the incentive structure. So now it doesn't concentrate in one company, but my question to them is where's your product? Mm. What is it doing for us right now? Mm. If you're spending, you know, billions and billions of dollars, I want to see the product. I want to see the impact right now. You know, and that's a, the, the gap that we're trying to cover right now is to progressively release product that directly benefits humanity, that is directly for the good and progression of humanity along the way while we build out super intelligence. Reminds me of, you know, the fact we only use 9% of our brain, like the the potential that we haven't tapped into yet is is massive. It's true. And I mean, when you look at like the the endeavor of science, right? I mean, the whole point of science is to um, to advance and generate new knowledge. It's not to just simply consume knowledge. You're meant to use a sequence of heuristics, of patterns of thinking in an order to generate new knowledge that can then be consumed by other scientists who can then stand on the shoulders of those giants and generate new knowledge. And our view on innovation is it's much the same, that we should be able to ingest all of the product of human ingenuity, recombine them in new ways, bring in new knowledge from other fields of science, and then generate new inventions that can directly benefit us. And that that, you know, the percentage of how much of that we've accomplished, you know, is now ex it, it, it's it, it's relative percentage is as low as it's ever been relative to the what's possible to achieve. Because mm. I think now it's sort of opening our eyes to how much we can truly do and then how much, you know, we can compress the time it takes to actually do it. So I think we're going to see in the next 10 years, at least 100 years worth of progress at the pace we were at 10 years ago. Okay. How are you ensuring then, Marcus, the originality and quality, you know, with patents that you create? So what we do is, you know, we generate, we generate inventions and then we generate the patents from those inventions, right? So what, what we're doing is we're inventing first. So the way that we invent concretely, sort of deterministically, is that we start from the science. We're the only system that starts determinately from the science. So the very first step, let's say you put in your idea. The first thing it will do is it will pull in all of the world's scientific literature about that into this thing that's called a knowledge graph. And all of that scientific literature, that's sort of making this custom model that's specifically for this idea. And it's the first time that, that, that this amalgamation of knowledge has ever been you know, composed for, for that specific idea. And then what it does is it does the same thing for all of the prior art and patents that exist in the world related to that idea and that scientific literature up to the minute. And so it starts to compound. And then it brings in what's happening in the industry. It understands the competitive landscape and the market in which that idea exists and the players and what they're all doing in that space. It understands the trend line of what they're doing. And then it predicts where it's going, right? Mm -hmm. And so then with that that those three variables, the science, the technical, and the commercial data, it's able to identify where the white space will be. So it's identifying where are the pockets, the under innovated pockets in that future knowledge graph. And then it's generating new intellectual property deterministically in that future white space, ideas that don't yet exist that will need to exist for us to continue to progress as a humanity because they're completely contextualized. And this just simply has not been possible before this point. You know, we the, even with the best data science, we didn't have these tools that were inherently polymathic that could instantly synthesize data from disparate fields from across the world, across the entire corpus of human knowledge, all in a few seconds. 
And so when we we have multiple competing models, our own proprietary models, foundation models, and they're in this system of debate. And what they do is they sort of they sort of compete and argue with one another to validate and parse the the the, the knowledge and the innovations that are generated. And then they breed the best ideas recursively. Um, and then what you're left with is this constellation of innovations at the end of the flow. And this all takes place in about 15 minutes. At the end of the flow, you get this, this, this pattern, this cluster of inventions. It's not just one invention. It's a, it's a multitude in a cluster that should exist. And then you can select and recombine which one, uh, which of those inventions embody what you intended to invent. Um, and, 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 Oftentimes what our users experience is they discover or encounter new innovation vectors or new ideas that they hadn't even considered that were related to their idea. And they get super excited about, you know, what it's inventing and um, and all of this stuff, all these inventions, they have citations associated with every part of the reasoning and thinking and critique process. So you can click on every single scientific literature journal article that was published related to it, all of the industry data that was related to it, and all of the prior patents, right? And it, so it, you you have access to the entire reasoning flow. You can, it's like you're inside of the thinking process of the system. We've only got like a, a minute or so left, but I do want to ask you uh, before we wrap this up about your deep invent for good event. Uh, I was just curious what were some of the maybe inspiring ideas that came came from that event? Yeah, so Deep Invent for Good, um, it was a really inspiring uh, competition that we we had announced. We decided it with a week's notice that we were going to launch this thing and try to accelerate our five year plan into like five days. And that was um, we wanted to run a two week contest. The best idea to benefit humanity would win ten thousand dollars. So we wanted to incentivize people to, in this case, invent out in the open and contribute their idea to the public domain. So in order to enter to win, they would have to they would have to submit this on LinkedIn in the public domain and allow people to build and innovate on that. Um, and so the winner, um, it was this phenomenal invention. We had amazing judges. Um, including the head of Microsoft Copilot, um, the the author of Blitzscaling, and many other inventors and innovators across the world. Um, and what uh, this idea was is it was a it was like a it was like a um, an intelligent transportation system that would for autonomous vehicles it would protect humans and animals from inadvertent collisions because as these systems spread and spread, the animals are very difficult to detect. And, you know, for these art, for these artificial autonomous systems, and that's harmful for the animals. And it's also very harmful for the humans if they're if they're involved in an accident. Right. And so this is like an emerging problem. And it recognized uh, this emerging problem and, the, you know, developed this new technology that allows these systems to communicate and also repels the the uh, the animals with um, this the sonic repellent that humans can't hear as well. It's just it was it was such a phenomenal invention um, and, and also vehicle to vehicle communication that's all meshed into the system. Um, and then there was another one that was super cool. Um, this one didn't win, but it got third place, which was um, this. Uh, so there was a kidney filtration system. This was a, from a seven year old. Um, that was the daughter of um, Brian Cliet, and um, they they had experienced, you know, watching this um, these flamingos like drinking salt water, and they, you know, did some research on how their kidneys do that, and they ended up like developing this like portable dialysis system, yeah. and um, it was some, just some brilliant IP. Um, and so the thing was, we had hundreds of submissions to this to this system to this competition all of these people inventing for the good of humanity. And it just showed that like anyone can use this system and develop completely brand new novel inventions that are valuable, that are needed. These aren't just, you know, random, you know, um, incremental improvements. They're, they're fundamentally things that we, we need as a humanity. And I think that that's kind of the idea is that at the societal level, when, when this is, you know, when this is scaled to the, the, the broader population, I think that we're going to actually see a tangible benefit to, to the innovation ecosystem and to humanity directly in the United States and abroad. Fascinating. It's been really good, Marcus, to have you on today's Plugged In and uh, look forward to watching you and Deep Invent go from strength to strength. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Great to be here.